Well, tonight we do have youth night tonight, and um, the boys and the girls that are here, uh, we'll want to go ahead and kind of get them in line here in just a moment. Book of Proverbs, chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. I want to just look at verse number four tonight. And I want to speak of the importance, or we could say, the value of two things, of what two biblical principles can bring into your life. Principle number one is humility, and principle number two is submittance or trust in the Lord. And once again, what these two principles can bring into your life as an individual. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Let me read that again. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. And I want to talk about the two ingredients for three very important factors in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the evening. And Holy Spirit, I need wisdom that comes from above. And I pray that you would give that for the Son to be honored and glorified and ultimately the Father. And no doubt this would be done by you and the credit would be for you. And bless the work that's taken place tonight throughout the church with the nursery and the working with the youth and bless for your honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Two ingredients for three very important things in your life. 
I would suppose most people, now we want to say all people, but you know, it's not the case I find being in and out of families and talking with people and trying to witness and encourage people in the faith and in the righteousness. But so I use the term most. Most people want to be successful. Would you agree with that? I think most people want to be successful. I don't think no one sets out not to be successful. Although I do believe that people can reach a point where they say, I don't care. Now God's able to turn that around, but that, that is out there. But most people want to be successful or wish they would have been more mindful of its reward. There is a reward from goaling and, and promoting in your personal life success. And sometimes some regret they would have done things different after they are in a place of life and time when it's very limited. That is time. They just can't do nothing else with their life. They, they've missed, I would suppose, an opportunity. Um, they've not taken time or the resources that God offered them during their life seriously. And because of that, now they're coming to a place where they're limited. They know they're going to be leaving this earth. And they look back on their life and they see a, a whole array of areas to where God had tried to encourage them in their life. The Bible teaches us, and we know personally, without the wisdom of the Word of God, but the Bible does teach it and confirm that life's choices are rewarded. Think about that. Life's choices are rewarded rewarded. Good choices are rewarded and bad choices they are rewarded. Life's actions life's actions are rewarded and whether they be good or bad they too have a result. Nothing goes idle or without fruit. It's just that some fruits better or from the good and some fruit is evil and from the bad. But nothing is idle. Go to Galatians chapter six with me. And let's look at verse number eight, if we would. And Paul says in Galatians chapter six and verse number eight, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now, if a person is going to sow to the flesh, they have got to make a conscious choice. They have got to participate. They have got to be active in that situation. Sowing is an active thing. We're getting to the time of year here in Indiana you know where I was at last week or the week before, but I thought of a preacher friend of mine out of Oklahoma, and he's got a farm farmer heart, but he's a preacher. He's a full time preacher, and we're friends. And years ago we were together, and we were driving through the country, and a field was being plowed, and he said, "You smell that?" or something in that order. But he goes, "I love the smell of fresh plowed dirt. Reminds me of a kid." And somewhere the other day I was driving down the road and I didn't see a tractor, but I smelt the fresh plowed dirt. And I looked over and way yonder was that real big tractor pulling behind it, I'm gonna suppose two 20, 25 foot each tillers and they were cultivating the ground. There's work to sow, you gotta be active. You gotta be active. So Paul says here, he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And because there is sowing, there is a reaping. Once again, nothing is idle. Fruit is produced from everything. And then he goes on and says, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So, Choosing to live a, we'll use the term carnal, or a flesh, or a personal-centered life 
There is a reward for that, and the Bible says it's corruption. It's corruption. And this would obviously be living a life and making choices apart from the Word of God. And then there is the sowing of the Spirit. And he says here that he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap of life. And of course we think of life forever. Eternal life. Now, in our text, in Proverbs chapter 22, there are three things mentioned that I would suppose not everybody is craving to have, but everybody wants. He mentions in verse number four, riches. Now, I'm not here saying that we're all craving to become rich. But the fact of the matter is, it is a good thing to have your bills paid. It's a good thing to have some things paid for. And it's a good thing to have some money so you can answer some things when they happen. Money's an answer. It answers things. <clears throat> and then he mentions number two, honor. And then he mentions life. So the text says that riches, honor, and life, they are mentioned as needful, and they are a reward of such who practice at least two things in the, in the proverb. Their reward. And now one thing about a reward is you, you, it's something that comes from your activity. So, the reward would come from those who practice and choose two things, humility, and he mentions the fear of the Lord. I believe that's correct, but in layman's terms, no correction of the King James Bible at all. I'm going to use that in a more practical way of the man or the woman who submits their life to God. Because if you fear the Lord, you're going to submit your life unto him. But if you don't fear the Lord, you're not going to humble yourself before the Lord. And you're not going to yield yourself to the Lord. Now, I don't think that you can have one without the other. I don't think that you're going to submit your life unto the Lord and, and surrender to him until you first humble yourself. And you think properly of who you are. When you and I think properly of who we are, then we're able to think clearly of who he is. But if we don't think properly of who we are, then we may never see the need of God. Now this is not only true in the lost world, but this can be true amongst God's people. To some degree, this was true with the prophet Isaiah in chapter six, when he seen the Lord high and lifted up, his response was, woe is me. He then got real sober quickly and fell into a place of, of humility when he had seen the, the mightiness, the greatness, and the majesty of the one who called him and created him. I guess we could ask ourselves three questions tonight. Number one, the first question, do you want to be financially safe and secure? I know I do. I don't want, uh, hello? Hi there, is this Joe? Who is this? Who's this? Who's this? I'm trying to get a hold of Joe. Joe who? I'm trying to get a hold of Joe Hart. Who is this, I said? This is the bank. And we are wanting our, that happens from time to time. It happens. But I, I, I don't like, I, I wouldn't like anything like that. But I know in reality from time to time this kind of stuff happens. So I'd ask the question again. Do you want to be financially stable? Do you want to be financially secure? Well, I can tell you this. 
However you answer that question is up to you. But I can tell you what God says about that question. God says, I can supply all your needs. He says, I can give you the desires of your heart if you'll delight yourself in me. I tell you, God, I personally believe, loves being a blessing to people. He does. I think he likes to be a blessing to us. And he is a blessing to us. So the first question, do you want to be financially stable? Do you want to be financially secure? Well, anybody with any sense would say, yes. No one would want to say, I don't know. I really don't care. No, you wouldn't think that, but that may happen. Number two, let me ask you the second question. Do you want a good name and a reputation that's decent? Do you want a good name? Do uh, you know the Bible teaches that a good name is to be more desired than great riches? Where's that at? In the same chapter, verse 1. First verse says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And loving favor rather than silver and gold. Do you want a good name and reputation? Well... And I think that most of us would. And I think the man who's made mistakes would say this. Yes, I do. And I've, I've made some mistakes and I've learned the value of making sure that's right. And I would suppose, once again, there are some that say, I just don't care what people think about me because I don't even care about myself at all. Now, we wouldn't think that that audience, that latter audience would be big, but it seems to be growing in number in these days we're living in to where more people are just not concerned about themselves. And whatever somebody tells them to do, they'll do it. And whatever they think they're to be, they will do it. And then let me ask you the third question. Do you want to live a God-centered, guided, directed, called life instead of your circumstances living you? Did you hear what I said? Do you want to live a God-centered, God-willed, controlled, blessed life? Or do you want to live a life where circumstances control you? There is a difference. Now, God says, if we, for whatever and however we are at in a plane in life, because wherever I'm at, I'm going to need a certain amount of riches to take care of where I'm at on my level. You're going to need a certain amount of riches to take care of you where you're at. I, I, you know, we had lunch today at the house and you know, and the wife says, is that all, is, is all the cheese gone? And I heard somebody say, well, there's only nine of us here eating. It's pretty common at the house. It ain't like a mouse, it's just it's me and my wife and a mouse. You got nine people eating. Well, what do you probably take three packs of cheese instead of two, but where I'm at in my plane of living, where you're at your plane of living, we're all a little bit different. So money means no more, no less, but it needs to once again meet them needs and answer them needs or wherever you may be at. And God, God will do that. Now, the idea of honor and the idea of life as well. God says, I reward, let me read it again, by humility and fear of the Lord. How, does, how, how do we get riches and how do, what is the secret to being, what is the secret of being financially stable? What is the secret of, of having a good life and living a good life instead of a life living you? What is, what is it that makes up such? Well, number one, it's you choosing on purpose to practice humility. And only you can make that choice. Only you can be actively involved in saying, I am going to be a humble man, a humble woman. I am not, the opposite would be pride. I'm not going to allow pride to harm me. By the way, humility is the opposite of pride. Pride deals with, I don't need nobody for nothing. And that's not true. It's just not true. 
Pride is, it's deeper than that though. It's, 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 it's a lot more buried and layered than that so that you can't understand it. Matter of fact, let me just say this about pride. The Bible teaches that pride has a daddy. And if pride has a daddy, then pride or, or children can be there for. Or pride can have offspring. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 16. Look at verse 18. And I want us to really understand a simple thought tonight, but can be profound in your life. Profound. Proverbs chapter 16, would you please take note of verse 18? And I want everybody to look at this. Pride goeth before what? Again, pride goeth before what? Pride goeth before destruction. And sometimes before destruction totally comes in, God might knock a leg off. Or he might give you a little this and give you a little that. Or do a little this and do a little that. Where you got to stop and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. That's his goodness. Watch. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Man, number two, we want to avoid that, don't we? Listen to this. I want to avoid pride. And I want to avoid a haughty spirit. Let me say this to us all here. We're all very real people. One thing about the Bible Baptist Church, we're, we're pretty down to earth here. We're pretty common blue collar people here with good common sense. But let me just say this. We live in a world of haughtiness. It's real easy for this. It's just no different than poison ivy. You get around somebody that's got something like this, all they got to do is touch you and it gets inside you. But we got to remember something, or at least be reminded of something that they don't know. And that is that haughtiness will cause you to fall. It'll cause you to go down. Pride. It goeth before destruction. It's, you know, sometimes every now and then you'll get to see on television that real big 30-story building, that monumentous building that meant so much in history that they're going to rebuild. And they'll go in there and pack that thing with dynamite. And they'll count down. Five, four, three, two, one. And they push that igniter. They click that igniter. And that thing and it starts to come down. Layer by layer. And it's so interesting that they, they drop that rubble right there where that building was at. And not to touch anything. And, and pride is like that in our lives. Pride is like that. And too much pride, there can be the igniter. And it breaks us. And by the way, pride does slowly try to break us down. You can't get riches but being prideful. You can't be financially secure by being prideful. You can't enjoy an honor name or a name of reputation or you can't enjoy pleasure with pride. You can't live life with pride. Don't, don't let no one fool you. You, you, can't, you can't live life by being prideful. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. How about James chapter 4? I think we all know that one. But it's worth looking at if you'd like to turn there. James chapter number 4. Now, by the way, when I'm talking about, I'm make sure that I want to make sure that I'm thinking right here what I'm getting across. When I'm talking about getting riches and getting honor and getting life, now make sure you're understanding what I'm talking about here. I probably ought to elaborate on this just for a moment. The Christian life is all about being a blessing to others. So anything like this that comes into my life is for you. And anything like this that comes into your life is for me and for other people. So God blesses us in order that we may be what? A blessing. Okay, just make sure we're, 
we're on the same page here. I probably forgot to bring that out and thank God he reminded me of that. But look here at James chapter four in verse number six. But he giveth more grace. Now, isn't that what we want? Don't we want more grace today than we had last week? Don't we want more grace? God will on Wednesday. Don't we want to come to church and get more grace in our lives than we had the previous Wednesday? But God giveth grace, look. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith. And, and he's going back to, um, I'll show you here in a moment. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the who? Does God give grace to the proud? No. Do we need grace as Christians? Ho, 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 do we need grace? Remind you, remind me, remind us of grace. It is the unmerited favor and love of God to people who are undeserving. Yes, we need grace. We need grace. Are, are we going to get grace by being proudful? No. No. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. Now, James was quoting off Proverbs chapter 3, that's verse 34. But going back here, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, I got to ask myself, do I really need grace? Yes. Why do you need grace, Pastor Hart? Because according to what Paul the Apostle said, and of course I know what Paul uh, said was right. He says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and these next three words about grace, teaching us that. Do you know grace is a wonderful teacher? It's a wonderful teacher. And I need grace to keep coming. In what areas? A few. Number one, as a man. Number two, as a husband. Number three, as a father. Number four, as a pastor. Number five, as a friend. All them areas I need to grow in grace in. And God, look, teaching us. And this is what Paul told the Titus. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. As to say that if we're not growing in grace, we're not going to be denying ungodliness, but we're going to be participating in it. And if we're not growing in grace, we're not going to be rejecting worldly lust. We're going to be caught up in the worldly lust. And that if we are not growing in grace, we're not going to be living soberly, but we're going to be living unsoberly. And we're not going to be living righteously. We're not going to be living godly in this present world. And we're going to be a good Christian worldling. That's not what you want. That's not what God wants. And that's not what humility brings. Pride? Yes. Yes. How about Job 41? You ever thought about this verse? Job chapter 41. This verse is one of them verses that is kind of overlooked, uh, although it, it's got great emphasis on a truth that relates to you and I in the thought of pride. In chapter number 41, he starts off by talking about, can thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? And of course, there is a little bit more of a, um, a, a dual prophecy here with Leviathan. Um, Leviathan is a crocodile. Okay, you don't have to get real complicated with this. You go back and chase down the Masoretic Hebrew and the conservative thought on the word, it's a crocodile. But it's more than a crocodile. It's Satan. It's a dual prophecy word. It's Satan. He, I know he talks about fire. I understand all that. So is the book of the Revelation. But people miss this because they don't read throughout the whole chapter. And if you read down throughout the whole chapter about Leviathan, I can show you here. He says in verse 34, he beholdeth all high things. You know what that means? Things that make for people being pride. He beholdeth all high things. Now let me stop and say this. Satan said, I will be like the most high. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will, I will, I will. That's all selfishness, self-centered, prideful uh, language. But look what it says here in verse 34 of Job 41. He beholdeth all high things. Watch this. Now this is in reference to Leviathan. Dual prophecy. Crocodile, but yet Satan. 
He is the king over all the children of pride. Is Satan a king? Yeah, he's a prince. He's the prince of darkness of this world. He's got a world system in this world he's functioning with. And he does control people in this world. And people do live under his influence. And, and, and watch. The number, the number one fruit that pride produces. Number one fruit that pride produces is this. <laughs> well, I believe in God. But I don't believe Jesus is God. I don't believe Jesus is God. And as I said Wednesday night, any person... It says, I believe in God, but I don't believe Jesus is God. Is not believing in the right God. They're, they're, they're hell bound if they don't get that right. You don't just believe in God. Jesus Christ is God. And that's what separates Christians from Christians. There's a lot of Christians that'll tell you, I don't believe he is God. They are wrong. And they're not serving God right. That, is, that, that was a true tester in the New Testament times. Jesus is God. But here we find, once again, that pride has a daddy. It has a father figure. He beholdeth all high things. And if you read this chapter, it gives an illustration of a crocodile to a degree. But boy, then it goes beyond that. And it talks about a descriptiveness of pride. Pride. Upon earth, there is none... Upon earth there is none like his, or none his like, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Humble. James, going back to James in chapter 4 and verse 10. Watch this. You know from time to time in life, you know what, you know what we all have very, very common Let's just, let's just face it. From time to time in life, and I've learned to face this because I've dealt with some low things, but I've learned to face this. From time to time, ladies and gentlemen, I think men, I think when you walk, hold it high. Don't hold it with arrogance, but hold it high. Hold it high. You know, be a man and hold it high and just have some structure about you. Have some squareness about you. And, and once again, not an arrogancy, but you know, hold yourself high. But in reality is, there is just things in life from time to time that just bring us slow. And we just sat in sackcloth and ashes. And we just brought low. Now how do we get back up there? Well, somebody says if you do this, you'll get back up there. Some say if you'll practice this, you'll get back up there. Well, if you'll just do this, you'll get there. But remember this morning we talked about discovering the greatest truth in the world. And discovering the greatest truth in the world says this. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. As to say this, you got that place by some reason. Figure it out. And submit to me. Give me the opportunity to pull you back up. Amen. And you know what? He's so gracious to do that. Amen. He is so gracious to do that. Man, I mean, you can be, listen to me. You can be in a bitter place and weeping and just a bitter place. And you could say, God, I don't deserve this. But I know I participated or whatever have you. And I know I have a say so in this. And I should have outthought this. But Lord, I, I, Lord, I, don't, I don't have nobody but you. I surrender my life to you. Please help me with this. And, and, and don't let me sink. He, he'll, he, humble yourself. He'll lift you up. He'll lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Now, by the way. Do you know that he's watching you right now? <laughs> you know when you're walking tall, he's watching? You know when you're down low, he says, look over at me. He's watching. Humble yourself in the sight. That's an interesting word he uses there. As to say that God's eyes are always upon his children. Amen. And they are always upon his children. Always. And I tell you, to know, to just to know that has brought me so much comfort in tribulation and trial. Look, when I know you're in a bad place, 
and that gets to me, I have peace in knowing God's with you. Your preacher has peace like that. I, I mean that. When you're in a bad spot and you uh, call and say, Pastor, this is going on, this is going on. And look, I can pray with you or get off the phone, but I, I got confidence in God because I know he's watching and he's right there with you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You remember, oh, Brother Frank, Brother Noah just preached here. Remember that message in 2 Chronicles? Man, that was a good message Brother Noah preached. You don't even know nothing about it, do you? <laughs> sure you do. You have to go back and think a little bit. But Brother Noah preached about 2 Chronicles not too long ago when he was here. If my people who are called by my name. <laughs> number one. If they will humble themselves. Watch. And, 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 and this is so, so important and so fitting. And, and, and what we need in life. I don't need to be a rich king, but I want things taken care of. I don't have to have my name in the newspaper, but I want it to be right. I don't have to um, put out uh, a series of CDs on how to live life, but I do want to live life. And so in the book of um, Second Chronicles, if you'll remember, there was prophecy going on here. There was prophecy taking place. And the Lord appeared unto him. And he's telling them this. Here's what he's telling them. You get too haughty in your life. You get too haughty in your makeup. You get to thinking too much of who you are, Israel. I'll bring you down. And then when you're down, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a pestilence upon my people, what's all this about? What would be, what would be shutting up heaven about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's a means of humbling a nation. How's the crop this year? Absolutely horrible. How are you guys surviving? Barely. It's a humbling factor. Watch. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, what's that? A humbling factor. That's a humbling factor. Or if I send a pestilence among my people. God says this. There may be a time in, my li in your life I'm going to have to intervene because you're prideful. And I'm going to do some things for your own good. And I'm going to withhold rain. And I'm going to come in locusts to devour the land. And if I need to, I'm going to send a sickness among all of you. And I'm going to take you from that prideful place. And I'm going to show you how weak and how fragile and how much you are dust. But here's what he says, because he's a loving, kind, merciful God. But when you're in that place, if you will call on my name, very first thing he says, as Brother Frank just said, if you'll call on my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear you. Now watch. I'll hear you. I'll forgive you. And I'll heal that land. See, this is what pride has got so many layers once again on it. We, we really, man, it's gotten me. It, it's gotten me a few times because it's so deceptive. Even if we think we're doing the right thing, it's so deceptive. Pride. Remember, and, 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 and speaking of Brother Noah, Brother Frank quotes this verse. And he doesn't quote it without just quoting it. I, I pay attention when he has quoted it. And uh, I, I want to quote it to you because I think, it's, I think it's, it's worth quoting and I think it's worth um, realizing and I think it's worth thinking about. He has showed thee, O oh man. You know what? He has showed us. He has showed thee, O oh man, 
what is good. And what doeth the Lord require of thee, of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly Amen. with thy God. Walk humbly with him. I'm telling you, there is a lot of value that God is able to put into your life when you turn your heart on humility and turn pride off. Humility is the starting factor with godly success, I do believe. And you know what humility has allowed me to do? Humility has allowed me to see me. It has. And it's a miracle that I'm even a preacher. It's a miracle. It really is a miracle. Humility has allowed me to see me. Pride does not, pride don't even want me looking at me. Pride wants me looking at everybody else. But humility has, 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 has set me down and said, now I'm going to show you some things. This ain't going to be easy for you. And it might be a little bit painful, but when you're done, you'll feel a lot better. Sit down. And I've had to sit down with humility, and humility has showed me this. Here's what you are. You're arrogant. You're a punk. You're a liar. You cheat, you steal, you this, you that, you this, you that. And what can I say to Mr. Humility? He ain't wrong. Well, well, what can I say to him? I'm just saying that humility allows you to see you. Which, number two, humility allows you to behold reality. That's one of the other great things about humility. Is it allows you to behold reality. What's really going on? around you. Humility allows you to behold reality as it is. And that gives us the ability to be equipped to minister to whatever that means may be. And let me say it allows you to see the difference. Humility is between your ways and God's ways. Isn't that true? Hasn't time taught you that your way is not good and God's way is right? That's only by the means and the method of practicing humility. Now I'm going to say this and we're going to move to the next point. We're going to try to conclude. To remain in pride is dangerous. Now I'm going to tell you why he says pride go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I'm going to tell you why. Because to remain in pride and to reject humility is to take lightly God's mercy, which he does not owe none of us. God is a merciful God. Ladies and gentlemen, our God is all powerful. He is dealing with a bunch of people on this earth that are not worthy. And those who are worthy are only worthy because of the worthiness badge from his son. Amen. If it wasn't for the badge of righteousness which comes from Christ, he is dealing with a bunch of people on this earth that are no good for nothing. We're not good for anything. That's humility. Pride will say, well, that's not true. Yes, it is true. Yes, it is true, because the Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above. Yes, it is true. Yes, it is true. And to remain prideful and reject humility is to take lightly God's mercy. I don't want to take God's mercy lightly. You know why I don't want to take God's mercy lightly? Because humility has taught me I don't deserve it. And it's because of his mercies, Brother Frank, I have not been consumed. That's the truth of this. That's the truth of this. And then the fear of the Lord. I love the fear of the Lord. I like to fear. I do like fear. But I love the fear of the Lord. Because it does something to me that nothing else in my life has ever done for me. I mean, I don't know if you ever, if you ever been in a position where you may have been in school and, you know, in school you talked to somebody and you treated them bad and you did things you shouldn't have done to them and, and they had enough of it. And, you know, you thought you were all prideful and arrogant. There, You know it was pride but arrogant. And then one day you get off the bus and you go to go home and guess who's standing there? That individual, about 10 or 15 people. And they're going to beat the living daylights out of you. I was watching something somebody sent me the other day about a boxer. And it was clean, but this boxer would like to get people to spar. And it says he liked to spar over spar until he got what he deserved. So what he would do is he talked these guys in the gym of sparring. So he'd spar. Once he started hitting this guys, 
any, and the guys would, you know, and then he would take advantage of it. And once they got on the ground boxing, he'd start boxing them, and he'd walk around the gym, and people are videoing him, and people are working out, staying out of the way. And this, and he did this to a lot of people. You want to box, want, want to spar? But his idea was that to spar, his idea was to try to intimidate him and really beat him up real bad. <laughs> yeah, news got out about somebody doing this, and some color guy walked in, and I guess he bumped into him, and I guess he said, sure. And that color man got a hold of him and started beating us, not out of him. And he got up and he said, no. He goes, oh, no, we ain't done. And he just got on him again, chased him out the parking lot. They go outside the parking lot, throws him on the ground in the parking lot, drags him back in the place, beats him up again. The guy goes over and goes, we're not done. You want to do this to people? Let me give you a taste of what you've been doing to them. And that guy probably got some fear that day that was probably good for him. I'm not saying, all oh, that's good. I wouldn't promote nothing like that. But in the, in, the, in, the, in the physical world, that guy probably taught, was taught a lesson that day about a little fear. About a little fear. And the fear of the Lord. And I'm talking about a reverence for our Creator that submits and trusts Him and His Word. You know what the Bible says about people in general? There's none righteous. No, not one. They've all gone out of the way. There's no fear of God before them. Go over and read Romans chapter 3. There's no fear of God before them. And, and, and by the way, let me show you that kind of attitude of, of what it is. And when we come into this place where we don't want to fear the Lord... A while back, I pulled up next to a guy and he had a helmet on, he had a sticker on there, and it said a curse word about fear. And I thought, you'll change on that sooner or later. You'll change. You'll change. You will learn that one day. And, and maybe he's a very hardened man, maybe he won't. But the fact of the matter is, listen here. There is none righteous, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You, you, already, you know why? This, this, is, this is a result of a lack of fear of God. Maybe I ought to go back up and read that. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open scepter. With their tongues they have used deceit. And poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet, well, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they've not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. So let me tell you something here, just on what he mentions here. Look at, look at the character of a man that says, I don't fear God, or the person doesn't fear God. Let me tell you what they're really like. First of all, the Bible says they're liars. They are tongues, with their tongues they use deceit. So people who don't fear God are liars. They will lie, number one. Number two, he says their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Number three, their feet are swift to shed innocent blood. Number four, destruction and misery are in their ways. We live in a culture today where most people are misery. They're in misery. There's a reason for that, ladies and gentlemen. That is a reward of something. I said when we started, nothing lays idle. Everything has got a reward. Whether it's sowing to the flesh, there's a reaping of the flesh, or sowing to the spirit, there's a reaping of the spirit. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You know what the psalmist said in Psalms chapter 37? Let me quote to you verse number 5 as we conclude. Great, great, great verse here. And here's what he says. It's, it's underlined in my Bible, and I'm going to quote it to you. Watch this. Psalms chapter 37, verse 5. Delight thyself also in the Lord, verse 4, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now listen. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That word commit it takes fear and reverence to commit yourself unto the Lord. 
And he, what's he saying here? That if you will commit your way into the Lord, he'll bring it to pass. What? Everything. Amen. Everything. Now, what I'm getting at is this. Give your way. Give your ways. Give them up to God. And then you can get God's way. And you can live in his ways. So there's great value in reminding yourself, be humble. Practice humility. Far more than I could say. There's great value for you when you say, you know what? I'm submitting to the Lord. I'm trusting God. I, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to do my, I'm not going to do what I think I need to do. I'm, 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 I'm submitting to the Lord. But, but nothing. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm submitting to the Lord. But you got to make a choice. I don't have to do nothing like that. I'm not making a choice against the scripture. I'm not doing it. I'm committing my way unto him and he's going to bring this to pass. I fear him. I trust him. I submit to him and I commit to him. And God says them type of people, or at least Solomon, would Solomon know? Solomon says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Father, we thank you for the evening you have given us and we thank you for your holy word. Lord, help us tonight to humble ourselves before thee. Thou art a great king, the king of kings. Help us, Father, in this sphere of growing in grace and honor and living life, a life that you have ordained, a life that you lead, a life that you protect, a life that you guide, a life that you empower, and a life that you bless, and a life that you approved. Such a life, no weapon formed against us, shall prosper. Such a life is promised. All things are working together for the good. Thank you for this simple thought, but the tremendous impact and the tremendous effect it can have upon our lives. Help us now tonight in Jesus' name. We pray and ask these things in. Amen.